go to another place. These are very limp because they've been sort of out of the running water since yesterday. So we're in the mountains just outside of Tokyo. You wouldn't believe this place is just a two hour train ride outside of Shinjuku. I'm here to find a surprisingly rare plant that lives deep in the Japanese mountains. I say surprising because anyone who's had sushi knows wasabi, the spicy green paste that gives sushi that extra kick. But despite its ubiquity, wasabi, this plant native to Japan, is very difficult to grow, something that I would learn firsthand on this trip. From limiting the amount of sunlight that hits the plant to keeping track of the flow of water, growing wasabi is an extremely pedantic process. The sort of environment this plant needs to survive isn't easy to simulate, which is why wasabi is one of the most expensive crops to grow in the world. So if wasabi is so expensive, how is it freely eaten with sushi everywhere? Well, if you've never been to Japan, it's likely you've never had real wasabi. Even if you've lived your entire life here, there's still a chance that all the wasabi you've ever had is only an imitation of the real thing, usually either coming from a small pack or two. And experts will be very quick to tell you that this is very different from actual wasabi. The average Japanese grew up with wasabi from a tube, so-called. It's fine on its own, but it isn't wasabi, and they don't know the difference. In this video, I want to uncover what real wasabi is, and on the flip side, what the more common fake wasabi is. I think it's important to know because real wasabi isn't only really freaking good, it's also an important part of this country's cuisine and history. Without wasabi, real wasabi, sushi wouldn't exist the way it does today. Soba wouldn't exist the way it does. There is a lack of proper knowledge and education surrounding wasabi, despite it being fairly well known. So I spoke with an expert on wasabi and visited one of the largest wasabi farms in the world to understand more about this herb, how it's impacted Japanese culture, why a fake version of it exists, and why you definitely need to try the real thing. I'm in Matsumoto right now. I'm here to visit this giant wasabi farm. But before that, I want to thank the sponsor of this video, Aura. Their help really allows me to keep making these videos get bigger and bigger. Aura is a really fitting sponsor for this channel because it relates to something that happened to me on the first day I started this channel. I had just flown on a plane to Korea to shoot my very first video. And after this flight, I came out feeling really fatigued and tired. And I fell for something I never thought I would. I basically got a text with a phishing link about my Netflix subscription. It was clearly suspicious, but I was exhausted and just clicked on the link without really thinking. Little did I know somebody hacked my accounts and stole my passwords, and it was a huge pain to try to clean up my accounts. And to be clear, this doesn't just happen to people. Recently, Ticketmaster got hacked and half a billion people's info were sold online. That's why I've started using Aura. Aura alerts me if my data ever gets breached like this, and it gives me fraud alerts if anyone tries to use that data to access stuff like my bank accounts or credit cards. But the main cool thing is that Aura can remove my information from data broker websites, so I would just be less vulnerable to these kinds of things in general. Like if I had Aura earlier, I wouldn't have gotten that stupid text about my Netflix subscription. And Aura knows that your money is worth a lot, which is why they also include a ton of other stuff, like a VPN, antivirus, password manager, and even identity theft insurance. Like you can get all of this and more for just one price. And if you click on the link in the description or go to Aura.com slash Matthew Lee, you can get your first two weeks for free on Aura. So thanks Aura for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to wasabi. All right, I'm here in Dayo Wasabi Farm. It's one of the biggest wasabi farms in the country. And I came here because I think most Americans have a very one note view of wasabi. Eat this wasabi. Oh, yeah. In the West, wasabi is seen as sort of like a peculiar thing. It's extremely spicy, like in a painful way. 
That was a lot of wasabi. Like when I was a teen, my friends and I tried to compete to eat as much wasabi as we could in the stupid way that teens compete in. But again, wasabi is so much more than just a spicy little green paste that most people just leave alone on their sushi plate. Granted, that's probably not even real wasabi. So I want to see the real thing, which even in Japan is kind of rare. And I want to show you what else it can be used for. All right, so the first thing I'm going to try is wasabi ice cream. Okay, I have no idea what this is supposed to taste like. Japan really likes to make stuff into ice cream. I remember the last time I had soba ice cream. This time they've got wasabi ice cream with a paste of wasabi on the ice cream. I have no idea what to expect. Hmm, that's refreshing. It's just like citrusy almost. The wasabi paste is it's a bit spicy. All right, next is wasabi croquette. Mm. Very tangy, surprisingly. We found out that they also sell uh, wasabi hot dogs, so let's see what this is like. It's definitely in the same character as mustard on hot dog, but oh, there's actually bits of wasabi plant, like the stems, inside the hot dog. I quickly found out that wasabi can be used in many more ways than I ever expected. In this farm alone, I found them selling wasabi salt, wasabi cheese, wasabi mayo, wasabi soap, and even wasabi lip balm. It made me wonder, if wasabi can be used in so many different ways, why is it usually only used with sushi? And why isn't most wasabi in the world made from this plant? So I reached out to the team at the farm to help me understand this. And they quickly showed me just how difficult it was to grow wasabi in general. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
and he fell in love with wasabi. The plant not only resembled his family crest, he was just a really big fan of the taste of wasabi. However, I eventually found out that the relationship between Ieyasu and wasabi was much more complicated. Now what is uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu's role with wasabi? Because I read a little bit about it. あ、そういうことを、in the early 1800s, wasabi finally met sushi. At the time, this variation of hand-formed sushi called nigiri was exploding in popularity across Edo. But this was a time without refrigerators, and this is raw fish we're talking about. Without refrigeration, sushi would quickly become smelly and riddled with bacteria. So sushi chefs turned to wasabi, an ingredient which they believed would kill germs on the fish and prevent food poisoning. And ever since, wasabi has been served with sushi and sashimi. Okay, so real wasabi is this plant, but this isn't what most people get to eat. This herb with all the history I just told you about very likely doesn't taste the way you probably think it does. Because again, most people have never had real wasabi. What most people are eating isn't this. Instead, your wasabi is probably made from horseradish and mustard with green food coloring or spinach juice. 90% of wasabi you get at restaurants or in stores is this concoction of ingredients mixed to imitate the flavor and effects of the real thing. There is a name for this fake wasabi, seiyo wasabi. The name refers to the horseradish in fake wasabi, which doesn't come from Asia by the way, but instead Europe. A majority of wasabi in Japan is European horseradish. The real thing is called hon wasabi, and the issue with it isn't just that it's difficult and expensive to grow. When you grate real wasabi, the flavor of it only lasts for about 15 minutes. In other words, if you don't eat wasabi within 15 minutes after it's been served to you, it's not gonna taste like much. And this is one of the reasons why fake wasabi has taken over the market. こちらの、そういった。ワサビ感が出るようなものを it's easy to see that wasabi's inherent difficulty puts it at a disadvantage. Even for a farm of this size, they're only able to distribute their wasabi mostly to the local area. I eventually wondered what farming wasabi would be like if you didn't have the land and capital that this place clearly had. So I met with someone who independently grows his own wasabi. These are very limp because I've been sort of not out of the running water since yesterday. 
that uh, could be okay, a sprout off like that, then it's possible to plant that because it's got plenty of root and the power is really going to be in the root in this case. This is David. He's an Australian who originally came to Japan as a journalist. He's been studying wasabi for over eight years now, and he was kind enough to show me his personal wasabi farm, which was very deep in the mountains. Um, when I prepare a growing area, mm -hmm. I need to uh, plow all these rocks to a depth of about the length of the blade. And that means that the plant to be able to put its roots down into flowing water, deep in flowing water. Make a hole. Hole fill up. That's how it works. Wow, ah, okay. After he showed us around, he asked us to follow him even further up the mountain, where we found the source of the water he used for his wasabi. And much like at Dio, David was meticulous about the contents of the water. He told us that these mountains were like a sponge, with several months of water in them. During that time, they would collect minerals such as tritium, and that's where wasabi gets its flavor and pungency from. Without these minerals, wasabi wouldn't work. A long time ago, a friend of mine called me. Uh, he was in the, uh, the embassy of Iceland. He said, David, we've got a, a new company in Iceland. They're growing wasabi. They want to talk to wasabi growers. So we had this conversation, mainly about can we send wasabi seedlings to Iceland? Uh, but it's interesting, I don't know whether they're getting their water from underground. They told me they're using town water and that would be mainly ice melt. It wouldn't be any good for wasabi as far as I know. You can't grow wasabi in just rainwater or got to have the minerals. He later brought us back down the mountain where he peeled the wasabi using a piece of deer antler. And at that point, the wasabi was ready to be eaten. Whoa, that's... That's so earthy. Yeah, that, that's... So much more complex than I think any wasabi I've ever had, actually. <laughs> just leave it for a while. Just now. Yeah. Just now leave it. I'm not exaggerating when I say that this wasabi tasted like how I imagined the mountains would. The layer of flavors was something I never had with wasabi. It wasn't just spicy, it was rustic and smoky, something that horseradish and mustard can't replicate. At this point, I want to mention that David does tours to his wasabi farms to show people a side of the food most don't get to see. Actually, two other Americans joined us on this tour, and they had their own thoughts on the wasabi. So you want to try it now, right away, and then after a minute, then maybe another minute. That's delicious. delicious. It's not spicy, really, at all. It's not, it's not really, no. No. It, it can get spicy when you get down closer to the bottom of the stem. Do you think this is the first time you've had the real, real one? wasabi? Yeah, definitely. Uh, in the States, uh, typically the wasabi that I've had is very spicy up front uh, to the point where like your eyes water and your nose. Nose. steam comes out of your ears, yeah. burns your nose. Uh, but this is uh, very lightly hot. I wouldn't even call it spicy. Um, it The flavor is very intense up front and then the kind of de-intensifies over a few seconds uh, and it becomes almost sweet. After we finished our wasabi, it started to rain, so we returned to the village nearby. But before I left, I wanted to ask David how he got so involved with wasabi in the first place. Uh, my wife and I would be hiking in the mountains, sometimes around this area, and we'd find wasabi patches out in the mountains. 
And I was curious about um, who who was doing this, who who was lugging their gear for an hour up the mountains, and was it worth their while? And and at the time, I was editing a magazine, so I was able to write a story and put it in the magazine about wasabi, and that got us involved with the local um, wasabi growers here. And eventually, one thing just led to another, and they they found us a house that we could rent and so we just decided to move into the area but i still had one aching question left i learned that fake wasabi is more prevalent simply because it's easier and cheaper to make and sell however i also wanted to find out just how fake wasabi came into existence in the first place the story that i heard anyway is that after the war during the during the occupation uh, of Japan, there are a lot of um, uh, military personnel who wanted to have a genuinely Japanese um, uh, food experience. It became popular to uh, to have sashimi and uh, and wasabi with that, uh, but the the volume just wasn't there to supply that market, and so somebody came up with this. Um, Substitute. As we continued to speak about wasabi and about our lives in Japan, David recommended that we try a wasabi ramen that was served in Okutama. As we found out the shop would be closing in an hour, he suddenly offered to give us a ride to the shop. Ah, well, right at the top, that's the one. Meibutsu wasabi? Yeah. And after eating this wasabi ramen, I understood why he was so adamant that we try it. Again, it was another flavor of wasabi I hadn't had before. The way it mixed with the saltiness of the ramen gave the spice factor an edge I've never found with any other dish. And to balance that salty spiciness with wasabi ice cream was icing on cake. After saying our goodbyes to David, I left with a greater appreciation for wasabi than I expected to have when starting this video. At this point, you might be wondering if you can even get real wasabi if you're not able to visit Japan. After all, it's safe to say that almost all wasabi sold at stores is actually horseradish. However, there's a chance that your country has an independent wasabi farm. In the US alone, there's two notable farms that grow wasabi, Oregon Coast Wasabi and Half Moon Bay in California. These farms sell wasabi online, and while it's not exactly cheap, it's definitely cheaper than a trip to Japan. In a world where humans have bred all of our fruits and vegetables into monstrous versions of themselves, wasabi's rarity and stubbornness has left it largely unchanged. Growing wasabi isn't really economical in our day and age, leading most to just imitate it instead. Most who do decide to farm it seem to do it out of a love and passion for it. And it's a shame that this tradition, this wonderfully cared for food, isn't accessible to most of Japan or the outside world. But it's people like David who are giving this food another chance at being noticed and not by trying to turn it into some bread version of itself, but through sharing respect to the plant and its natural habitat. It's more than just a spicy seasoning to sushi. It's a millennium old tradition that supports our health and has historic significance to the Japanese identity. I'm not here to say that fake wasabi is inherently bad, and neither are Dial Wasabi Farm or David. Uh, you can have, a, if you've got a very nice uh, wasabi, uh, so-called, from the tube, then you can enjoy that too. It just isn't wasabi. It's just the fact that wasabi is um, more difficult to handle in that sense uh, means that uh, there's, there's still going to be a place for fake wasabi no matter what you do. But experiencing real wasabi, likely the same way people have for thousands of years, brings a reverence to the act of eating, something I think more people should be exposed to.